Welcome to Wide Awake Stories from Insomniac. This is a journey by a journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new value, and a new experience. Broadcasting from the Insomniac HQ, this is Wide Awake Stories. Welcome to episode 14 of Wide Awake Stories. We're broadcasting once again from Insomniac HQ, and we got a pretty full house today. To my right, as always, is Rob Seamus. Hey, hey. To my left is Sam Yu. How's it going? And uh, we got two new faces. We got Ross Gardner, uh, contributor at large, and uh, Deirdre Coleman from the Insomniac family. What's up, guys? Hello. Thanks for having us, Rich. You had your voice on. Hello. Yeah. (laughs) And Ross always has his voice on. Yes, permanently trapped inside this accent, unfortunately, (laughs) like a prison. But you know what? Like, you're one of the only people that I know that has that accent that you can actually understand. Yes, yes, yes. I do hear that a lot. You know, it's like as I've kind of, uh, it's smoothed off over the years. So the sharp edges have become kind of softened just for the Americans. So you guys know what I'm talking about. Well, thanks for that. If you've been listening to Wide Awake Stories, you caught an interview there. Ross did with two of maybe the uh, oldest and most fun headliners at EDC Las Vegas, uh, the couple that works security at the media room. Yeah, lovely, lovely people. Uh, yeah. So kind of youthful and vibrant, you know? It's like, they, they, I think the whole time that we were at EDC, they kind of kept us going while we were in that media area because you could just see everybody's energy levels deteriorating throughout <laughs> the weekend, but they were just so full of life. Can you believe that that was what, six months ago? I can't believe 2017 is almost over. How was your year, Sam? How was your 2017? I mean, my year was much of the same. Uh, A lot of partying and uh, late nights. For me, one of the highlights was roughly 11 or 12 months ago now uh, in Tulum. Damian Lazarus has his day zero party, which is no longer a thing, RIP. But yeah, just going to parties like that is super inspirational and being able to take what I've experienced there back into this company. It's it's good. I, I enjoy venturing outside of Insomniac events for inspiration. That's funny. My favorite thing was watching the videos on Instagram of Damien Lazarus. <laughs> Zero oh, party. Oh, the bar super high. Super high. Get old, mate. Come on. <laughs> I'm joking. That wasn't my highlight of the year, but I was really bummed. Like I had a severe case of FOMO watching those videos and wishing I was there because it absolutely looked like one hell of a party. Yeah, I was there the year before for uh, 2016, I think, and it's like he has the uh, Damien Lazarus has the guy from uh, this behind Cirque du Soleil, Soleil, right? Yeah. So so, I mean, the production is just mind-blowing, you know, and you wander off into the jungle into this kind of tiny little enclave, which is just lights and performers. It's like wandering into another planet. It's incredible. Yeah, completely. Well, it has these incredible performers that usually come out and they do all of these like drum solos and are basically orchestrating the entire sunrise, and it's just magnificent to behold. That's kind of like what why Middlelands 2 was so special I think is because it, it kind of puts you in this whole other world and it really just embraced the embraced the theme and it just it went all in yeah, I think one of the highlights for me this year was uh, EDC, actually. I mean, I came into that event kind of feeling a little bit sort of jaded and burnt out with festivals and going to the biggest, craziest, most outlandish rave on the face of the earth was actually like really heartwarming to see that many people, particularly like when everything's been a bit weird in America right now and everybody's feeling a little bit sort of isolated. It was really nice to come to a place where everybody was just coming together, leaving all that shit on the edge of the dance floor and just having a really, really nice time. Like you've really felt the love there and, and it really rekindled something for me. We were even joking after EDC that uh, you started using the word headliners pretty regularly in yeah, your vernacular. Yeah, I drank that Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was suddenly, I was like, I, you know, I like it though. I like what it means. It's The one thing that I think Insomniac does does better than anybody else, any other promoter in in the country, and I would argue the world is that they bring people into dance music, right? Like they are the gateway to dance music for so many people. And I think that is my highlight is being able to go to festivals and watch people just like their eyes light up. 
that was one of my favorite things about this year too is seeing you change the transformation of Ross the transformation of Ross (laughs) over three days of EDC and being a bitter bastard on day one (laughs) and drinking the Kool-Aid on day three and I appreciated that because that is one of the things that is most special to me about doing what I do is are the people I mean, I've always been like a kind of underground house and techno guy. I like wee rooms, you know, 200 people, that kind of thing, you know, like long sets from DJs, you know, that's that's more where I come from. But, you know, I kind of, I got this sort of newfound appreciation for the role that these large scale events play because they are, like you say, Rob, a factory for this scene. You're creating the ne- the next generation of dance music fans you know and yeah okay sometimes I might see I might find some of the stuff like it's not exactly to my liking but I can appreciate that a few years down the line those some of those people that are listening that are down at the front of the main stage the whole time are going to be listening and exploring new forms of the music and I think that Insomniac's always done a super nice job man of making sure there's something in the festival for any stage that you're at and that's that was what was really nice and when I realized that like day three I was set man and I, I was you know was part of the cult (laughs) (laughs) I mean I absolutely agree and I appreciate the fact that you were able to experience that firsthand because seeing these people who grow up essentially there at the festival return expand their music tastes it's it's awesome yeah year one is kinetic field year two is exactly then you end up at the neon garden like Sam yeah (laughs) Garden parties forever. It's funny that you <laughs> mentioned, and now that I'm thinking about it, I think my favorite thing over the year is the cumulative work that we did at the festivals for our Awesome People series. If you guys don't know, if you go to insomnia.com, we have a series that we do that connects to every show called Awesome People We Met at Beyond, Awesome People We Met at EDC. And we have an opportunity to go out and talk to people who catch our eye and ask them a few questions about why they're there, where they come from, what they do. And there are so many times where we talk to multiple people and you ask one person, well, how many nocturnals is this for you? And they're like, oh, it's my fourth, my fifth, my sixth. And you ask their partner, how many for you? And they're like, this is my first rave ever. Like he brought me or she brought me. And they're doctors, they work at fast food places, they're baristas, they're teachers, um, they're students. And I, I, I kind of wish back in the day, someone would have like stuck a microphone in my face and asked me like, why are you here? Where you come from? And you know, what do you love most about the scene? And I think being able to connect with people and talk to them at our shows, that's kind of the highlight for me every year. Yeah, we didn't hear from you, Deidre. Well, politics aside, focusing on the positives, um, I'm reminded again how wonderful it is to live in Los Angeles. There were a handful of really special evenings out that um, I am particularly grateful for. Um, I'm hoping to see more Factory 93 type shows in the new year. Um, That sort of crowd, that sort of vibe. I try to do one new thing a year and this year I was fortunate enough to make it all the way to Glastonbury saw some really incredible nice. sets out there yeah it was so it was spectacular jealous. so I mean that's definitely one off the bucket list that I'll remember till my ripe old age still raving in the retirement home you know I always wanted to go but it's like as I've kind of moved out here to California like I've noticed that I've become sort of softer and softer and more averse to the mud and the rain like I don't think I could do it anymore I've been to like a few Coachellas do you know what I mean and I look at Coachella next to like Glastonbury or Tea in the Park if you don't know anything about Tea in the Park go and look at like Scottish things that happen at Tea in the Park on, oh boy. on Twitter it is it will shock is it safe and for offend and not so for- you <laughs> You know, but I, I've always wanted to go because I've heard it's such an incredible event um, with so much diverse oh, things yeah. to see, right? Like way more than just the music. Absolutely. We want to know, of course, what you've been doing all year. What have some of the highlights of 2017 been for you? Shows, life experiences. Did you take someone to their first rave? Uh, find us on Twitter at insomniac.com, D O T C O M, or on Facebook at insomniac.com. And hashtag Wide Awake Stories. Broadcasting from the Insomniac HQ. This is Wide Awake Stories. Come on. All this talk about everyone, like everyone's highlight was going out in the year and you guys talked 
to the nightmare, which is kind of a funny term to say out yes. loud and hear yourself nightmare. say. Nightmare. Yeah, the nightmare is a pretty cool concept. It's kind of like uh, if Batman were a clubber. That's kind of what I envision the, the, the position of nightmare to be. But Ross, you can elaborate a little bit on this. Yeah, so there's kind of a, a movement happening around the world right now for cities to have this figure come in who acts as a mediator between the club scene and the city government. Because cities are starting to realise that if you've got a healthy, vibrant nightlife scene, you're going to get economic benefits, you're going to be able to have you know, lots of young creative people are going to want to move to your city, which is be- which is beneficial for the job market and lots of different kinds of things. So in Amsterdam and Berlin, London and New York um, and a handful of other cities, they've started to install these guys there, these nightmares or night czars. And they essentially have the dopest jobs in the world. They basically just go out a lot and explain to the government what the importance is of nightlife. It's really cool. God knows we need better representation as a scene because we've always kind of been criminalized either via noise complaints or whatever other problems like electronic music particularly tends to get shafted and i feel like you probably have an interesting view um just from being so active in the american dance scene and also having your experience overseas like what do you feel like some of the biggest problems that we face that are completely different than what amsterdam or or Paris or any other international city would face. There's a level of understanding, for instance, that exists in Berlin and Amsterdam that club culture is valuable for lots of different reasons. In Berlin, like 30% of the, the tourism dollars that are generated come from clubbing. You know, that's an enormous impact that it has. So they've always tried to make sure that the club scene is healthy, is vibrant. They try and work with them, you know. Over here, there really is like a, a serious breakdown in communication. So that's the first the first step is really trying to get everybody conversing about this. I mean, like New York City right now has done amazing things in the past year where they have organized on a grassroots level. They had a young politician called Rafael Espinal who took this issue up and really rallied everyone. And they've managed to get some really, like, really old, archaic laws changed as a result of just engaging the cabaret law. Yeah. Yeah. And they have a nightmare that's going to happen in New York soon, right? Yeah, early next year. I mean, LA, but LA is still some ways behind, you know? Like, we... We had a push to try and extend the drinking hours till 4 a.m. I think that's like super important first step for us probably. So Merrick came into the Insomniac offices with me yesterday and we sat down with Rich and we had a great chat and learned a little bit more about the role and what's coming next for this movement. Check it out. Wide Awake Stories from Insomniac. Merrick Milan, the nightmare of Amsterdam. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me on the show. Let's talk about the concept of of what a nightmare is. I think that's a term that may be foreign, uh, not so much to our European listeners, but definitely for our, our domestic listeners might have some questions about what a nightmare is. It sounds like a very amazing job, kind of like the, the Batman of the club world. Uh, give us a little bit of a, of a background on, on what this job entails. To start off with, the Nightmare is an independent, non-for-profit foundation which helps ensure that the city of Amsterdam has a dynamic and vibrant nightlife. We really want to bridge the gap between the municipality, so that's mayor and city councillors, small business owners like nightclubs and festivals, but also city residents. We always say it's by having a dialogue you can change the rules of the game. So why is it so important to have this dialogue? Because the night is always treated differently than the day. When there's a problem at night, the first reaction, whether it's a nightclub or at a big festival, first reactions of city officials or police commissioners is always say they have to stop this now. Instead of bringing all the stakeholders together, bringing the smart people together and come up with a solution that might actually um, work or at least make it a little bit less. So we really focus on getting this dialogue going and getting uh, nightlife out of this zone where it's always seen as something negative. And one thing I think is like is is really interesting about this is the idea that you're kind of like a translator between the club scene and the city government because those two sides speak a totally different language from one another. So can you talk to me a little bit about like 
what that kind of mediating role means and like what and why it's very important to have someone in your position speaking to both sides. I think you can really say I'm like the eyes and the ears of the mayor by night. Uh, I've been working with the mayor of Amsterdam uh, for six years now, and um, because I I also understand it's really difficult to penetrate the city's nightlife from your office in city hall. So they know a lot about uh, housing, hospitals, you know, all these kinds of infrastructure things. And also, of course, about city planning. Because also nightlife and having a vibrant nightlife is also about planning and mapping out your city. So we really always try to find the middle path in between um, what do the um, uh, club owners want, what do the festival promoters want, and what is uh, and where does the city get engaged with that. And you're coming from the club background. You're a former club promoter, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, um, I I started organizing parties when I was 20. I really think that these kind of club events or small little festivals can be business schools for young creative kids. And that is always our argument. Like there's a lot of talent development for the creative industry happening in nightlife and on festivals. And that is always something which is interesting for city governments to think about. Hey, we, if we have a lot of young creative people living in the city, there will be followed by the creative industry and which is definitely an engine for um, uh, for economic and area development at the moment. How long do you think it took for you, because you've had this job since you were 31 and you're 36 now, how long did it take for you to sort of be in those governmental discussions and convince those people, look, we're not just a lot of miscreants and troublemakers <laughs> operating in the shadows. There's yeah. opportunity here. There's a dialogue that's valuable here. Yeah. How long did it take to kind of change the mindset? Because I assume that's the first big step to doing what you need to do. Yes, that's uh, that's absolutely correct. So um, in Amsterdam, it took me for like two and a half years uh, to get acknowledgement from city council for the value that our subculture created. But also, which is really important, is unifying the nightlife scene. Because sometimes uh, I always look at club promoters or festival promoters sometimes as surfers. You know, they want to ride their own wave. Very <laughs> <They're>, territorial. <yeah. laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's not always like, so it's also about unifying the nightlife scene, letting them work together, uh, speak in one voice, and then also getting the city on board. Because cities don't speak so often to single operators. They always want to speak to more like a group of people. So our organization is structured that 50% of our money comes from city hall, and the other 50% comes from uh, entrepreneurs in nightlife, whether it's nightclub owners, festival promoters, but also even DJs and other suppliers to this as well. Um, and I think that was that was a big challenge, but we are now, um, since we uh, got the nightlife scene unified, we really saw that we were making progress. And I think one of the biggest, um, um, uh, the biggest things that we introduced was the introduction of 24 hour licensed venues in Amsterdam. Um, I could have, uh, I, I explained to the mayor of Amsterdam that if we still want to compete with cities like Berlin, but also London, of course, in a way, uh, that we need to have legislation um, that will make, that, that fits the needs of the party goers, of the patrons at night. Because this is, a, this is something which I see happening really often, is that people go to warehouse spaces or go to DIY places in, like in New York, um, not because they maybe want to go to an illegal party or rave, but the legislation doesn't fit their needs, so they're, they're looking for something new. And this is, I think, a topic which is important also for the US. So this is a nice segue because you mentioned Berlin. We're talking about Amsterdam. These are two cities that are um, historically much more supportive of the idea of these nightlife businesses, a bit more pragmatic, a bit more liberal. And then you introduce New York City as well. So this at the moment I think is interesting because we're starting to see now via your role, the role of, of some others in cities around the world, is sort of bridging this kind of gap and bringing this conversation to the United States. Where, and I think you were kind of getting at this a little bit earlier, Rich, we might sort of run into some problems where in the United States, maybe it's going to take a little bit of time for the for the city governments to recognize that nightlife is valuable and is not a nuisance. So maybe like, can you tell me a little bit about what the sort of potential challenges are within the United States and how maybe we start to overcome those? Yeah. So 
Um, when a city will look at nightlife, they will always look on uh, the downside. I think nightlife has an upside and a downside. And, and of course, uh, the upside is what I explained before, is the benefits you have from social, cultural and economic perspective. Um, social, just people meeting, having fun, connecting with each other. Cultural, talent development, on the dance floor, in the DJ booth, on the, uh, by taking photos of, or being a VJ. Economic, of course, the money you spend at night. Uh, but the downside, of course, of nightlife is... Uh, um, uh, nuisance of any sort, littering, um, uh, that, that kind of stuff, noise of course, um, heavy drinking, drink driving, that kind of stuff. So the city will always look at these problems like top down, so how are we gonna um, change this? Uh, but what I think we have to offer is that we get engaged with the nightlife scene, get engaged with the operators, and if, we w- if cities want to change the behavior of people that go out at night, they need to work together with the operators, they need to work together with with um, influential uh, performers, DJs, uh, other people, uh, because only by working together we will we will uh, make a change. And if we, um, I think our approach was always to sit down around the table and say, hey, um, this is what we have to offer. We know what you want. Eh? Well, you, we, we know what the city wants. So let's start talking from there and see how we can how we can change things uh, with small steps. Also, the 24-hour licenses it didn't happen overnight. It was like a four-year process, uh, and and you change it street by street, block by block, and that's how we do it, you know. Because the um, uh, the touching on we're now of course here in LA, the the um, changing the legislation from four from two a.m. to four a.m. It didn't run because. People are just afraid. They don't. They don't know what's going. And our approach is really to focus on the quality. Um, uh, start with. Uh, we started with ten clubs for the twenty-four hour licenses, and we're going to hopefully uh, turn this to twenty clubs. Uh, so it's really step by step. It's not. It's always a slow process. I think you know it's interesting. Yeah, to, to bring this, I guess, locally to Los Angeles and talking about the four a, the the push to to um, extend the drinking hours until four a.m. There was. What that sort of, um, I guess, movement or push lacked was a movement. It didn't have the public engaged. There wasn't any kind of grassroots support or development for it. New York City, the progress that they've made in the last little while with the introduction of a nightlife office, with the removal of the cabaret license, which if you don't know what that is and you're listening, you know, check that out and read up on it. Yeah, for people that don't know this, um, uh, in the end of 2017, a nightlife uh, mayor will be appointed in New York. So that's like one of the first major cities that also will have this nightlife mayor position and of course I'm hoping that it will spread out to the rest of the US because there's everywhere where you have a scene uh, you have this uh, there's this opportunity for this office so please go on yeah no no I think it's like Uh, I think the reason they were able to achieve what they achieved in New York City was because the public and the the, the nightclub scene was engaged. You know, digital, like, so they set up digitally Facebook groups and things. They organized in person. They went out and they, you know, they picketed, they protested. They yeah. actually got out there, made their voices heard and applied some pressure to the government. But they recognized that, they made the argument that these spaces are, yes, they're economically important, but they are very socially important, right? Because nightlife venues are traditionally safe spaces for all different kinds of people from minority groups LGBT groups so I mean do you think it's important that that these kinds of um, that we sort of find these narratives and we find these stories when trying to get people engaged and that we really try and engage the grassroots in these movements yeah I really I really think that's really important and I would also uh, say to all the listeners like um, um, that it's important to also to let your uh, voice be heard you know to say you're engaged with your scene uh, definitely for a city as LA where it's so important that like um, community building is really important and nightlife is a way to do this uh, definitely when when a city is so spread out so um, it's really about making your voice heard uh, making sure uh, you know every um, a chance you get to to write a petition or to, to do something else you know get with us get with us on this team and try to change cities we talked a little bit about the social benefits how do we convert people and, and change the thinking that economically this is beneficial for everyone we definitely also focus on the economic impact but we 
we um, uh, and the next step we're taking is focusing on the cultural impact. Uh, that's why we also created this uh, project called the Creative Footprint, and uh, which is actually a way to measure the amount of creative spaces. And when we say creative spaces, we need we, I mean music venues. Um, so uh, together with a Harvard professor, we uh, created um, an algorithm to uh, count the amount of creative space in the city. And uh, uh, and with this report, we can find answers against gentrification. Because the same as with the carbon footprint, uh, if you chop down a couple of trees, you want to replant them somewhere else. And we want to make uh, the city aware. We really want to create awareness for the fact that these, uh, uh, the, the, these venues, these spaces are important for the city. And by um, handing these figures also to city governments, we hope to influence decision making on a higher level. Uh, because um, uh, we need to uh, we need to have these creative spaces for people to develop their talent and come together. But they do also play like a, I mean you know and this is something that's been written about quite extensively. You know they do play an unfortunate role in the gentrification process of neighborhoods. You know we've spoken about this before and talked about you know these clubs these interesting club spaces that are pushed out to the periphery of neighborhoods because the rent is cheap for one and because there aren't that many buildings around, or there aren't that many residents around you get less you noise get, complaints you get less noise complaints so but what happens as soon as that club gets there then you got a couple of bars appearing around it then you got a couple of boutique stores then you got artists moving in the loft space and then you get the developers coming in and kind of you know sort of cannibalizing the, the independent culture of that neighborhood and then what happens when the luxury apartments go in everybody moves in they have their kids and then the Cone thing goes a little bit further out. That, the thing that brought them into that neighborhood they're complaining about it you know so that is something which you see happening really often and that is something we are fighting against really hard so always like when a um, when a new venue goes into an area uh, there there like there needs to be we need to make sure that there is some sense of integrity with city planners that understand that this value of a venue or place help to uh, help to develop this area you know uh, worked on uh, safety because like uh, safety and mobility is one of the key factors for creating a safe nightlife you know and, um, and and lighting is really big part of that I've seen here already in LA there are some warehouse parties and who's done who's done the lighting that is actually the club owner or the venue the, the, the warehouse owner instead of the uh, instead of um, the city government so that is like actually so that's why we need we need to get our foot in the door and that's why we're starting this conversation I think what we have now there's like uh, there's at this moment more than than tight, 10 nightmares around the world there are so um, the, the first cities in New York are appearing and what we need to do is we need to get on the table and not in a couple of years when everything is again changed to another neighborhood we need to be there now and and when we see uh, um, areas develop that we say okay please keep in mind that in five years time you're going to keep this venue there going what do the promoters need to do here in the states yeah. because it sounds like the promoters in amsterdam and everyone's kind of banded together and said look we're on this we're on the same team yeah but when you said surfers, I thought that was a great analogy because yes, they like to ride their own wave, but surfers are also very, very territorial. Yeah. And coming into the States, there's, take this is Los Angeles, for instance. Yeah. Um, what is your message to the promoters about banding together, about really creating an alliance to work with the government to, to really enact change? What we always say is don't you don't start with installing a nightmare, you start with having a conversation. And um, uh, and uh, I think like um, uh, nightlife is an ecosystem, and of course you're competitors, but you also need each other. When everybody's speaking about like okay, so LA is the place like uh, uh, to go to, or Berlin or New York, more artists will come in, and more also people from outside will come in to fill up your clubs. So I think uh, it's really good to get together. Um, it just start otherwise just start with a smaller group that that sees this this value and try to come up with a white paper or with like a manifesto about what you think your nightlife should look like and present this to city hall uh, get like a young politician on board who understands this value and try to like create this um, yeah in the end we need to create this bridge of trust between the nightlife scene and the city government so they take action on city planning uh. and it takes a very very specific sort of uh, set of skills I guess to be able to be a night a nightmare figure you know like your background obviously in the club scene gave you 
not just an understanding of how the club scene runs, but a legitimacy. Well, credibility. Credibility within the club scene. You know, these people know you, they trust you. You know, Amsterdam's a small city. You know, I'm sure by the time you were the nightmare, everybody knew who you were anyway. You know, so what are, so what are the kind of ca- key characteristics for someone filling this sort of role in America and for the politi- for the young politicians as well? What do they need to have? Yeah, so um, a, while, a while ago, I adopt, adopted this this uh, this uh, this tagline said, a rebel in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I really come from the, from the club team. I've been promoting parties since I was 20. Just uh, and not with uh, name dropping too much. Much, but we were the ones to introduce like people like uh, Boys Noise, Too Many DJs, Errol Alcon, uh, Justice, all these guys to the Dutch scene. And um, uh, what is it? What is important is that um, you. I will never walk into City Hall or have a meeting in, at the mayor's office like wearing a cap and a hoodie and <laughs> so yeah. you're, you're doing this all wrong. You know? So then I will suit up and uh, and make and make sure that like, like that that our voice is heard. Um, so um, I think it's somebody that can speak the language of both sides, really knows what's going on because you don't want to like. What we always do is we try to empower communities bottom up uh, for them to get acknowledgement for the value there subculture and nightlife creates for the city uh, to eventually influence decision making that's what we always always doing but we you need, need to do this with heart and soul and i have a lot of heart and soul for nightlife where can people go to online are there some websites are there presentations or white papers that you guys have that you've created that can educate people in los angeles people in new york to the benefit of this whole movement um so one one website people should definitely ch- uh, check out is uh, the creative uh, footprint.org um, there you can also um, uh, leave your uh, email address if you want to be engaged and want to know what's happening. We're going to do the we did the creative footprint for Berlin. We're also going to do it in New York, uh, beginning of 2018. Uh, so this is the first point of contact. We always try to uh, help people. So reach out to us, and we will come back. Wide awake stories. Rebel in a suit. That was an awesome line. I really dig that. Like that is what dance music needs right now, right? Like Rebel in a suit. Yeah, Rebel sure. in a suit. I dug your surfer analogy too, man. Yeah, surfers yeah. get you know just promoters and surfers, man. Territorial is all get out. Yeah, so Merrick as well. He mentioned during our conversation that um, we were working on a project called the Creative Footprint. We are measuring all of the live music space in New York City in order to try and you know equip the creative scene with the data that they need in order to protect themselves against negative gentrification, to represent themselves on a governmental level. Now, we're running a Kickstarter campaign to support this, which is underway right now. Um, So if you go to Kickstarter, uh, search for the Creative Footprint, you're going to find that. Uh, Support us. If you're interested in this kind of thing, go to our website, creativefootprint.org, drop your email address in there, um, and just stay up to date with this movement because it's super important that everybody get involved and protect their club scenes and it really does benefit everyone who's probably listening to this show right now yeah and hopefully we'll see it in uh california hopefully later trying to make it happen trying to make it happen what what is measuring what do you mean by that um so we're gathering like 15 data points about each music venue like five that relate to the side to the physical space five that relate to the kind of content and programming that happens inside it and then five five data points that relate to the operating conditions that the government places upon the the district and the venue so ultimately what comes out the other end is an analysis of like where your venues are and the kinds of cultural impact that they have in those spaces so it's it's a very different kind of study um and could be a really innovative one and a very important one for the for the club scenes good for facts versus emotion right facts versus emotion baby merrick milan rebel in a suit <laughs> amsterdam nightmare <laughs> taking it to crush town this is wide awake stories Next up, Sam, who uh, who did you link up with for this episode? Yeah, if, if you've been listening to the last couple of episodes, uh, I've been getting with a few artists and been trying to get a few of their first-time stories. This time, I linked up with Slushy, Ray Volpe, and Tasaki, who uh, were kind enough to share their first time attending a rave or a dance music festival, whatever they're being called these days. 
And what I thought was interesting, they're all three um, relatively new guys on the scene. So their transition from attendee to being on stage is, is still pretty recent. Two out of the three actually don't really go to parties much. So it speaks a lot to the just the bedroom producer phenomenon that's happening nowadays. It, it's interesting to kind of try to get into the headspace of someone who doesn't really find themselves on the dance floor as much, but is still trying to crank out massive tracks for the dance floor. Artist Relations. Hey, what's up? My name is Ray Volpe, and I'm a dubstep, oh boy, oh, all the types of electronic music producer. I even sing a little bit, like, ooh, just, you know, just it's a little, it's a little snippet. Uh, today, I want to tell you guys a little story, if that's okay. A lot of people shit on Plur that I know and stuff like that, and I never personally shat on it, but I did see, like, I was like, oh, I can see why people, you know, dislike it or people, you know, like, might feel a certain type of way about it, but when I started playing shows and I went and I did it and I see like how these people are and the way that they feel and the way that it, music impacts them it makes so much sense and I'm all for it and I'm not I don't sit there and advocate it but I'm all for it at the same time I'm just like you know if that's how you feel like I like I love music and the way it makes me feel is something I can't describe in any other way than when I just make it or if I'm playing a show and if you know people want to sit and you know they make they're making awesome you know uh perlers and like candy cuffs and all this cool stuff like that's that's amazing I don't have talent like that I can't even draw a stick figure I don't know how I'm even making music honestly I was never someone that attended shows I don't I feel like I'm a an extroverted introvert. Is that the right? I don't know if that's the right thing. I have a introverted extrovert. I, I don't know what. It's whatever it is where it's like I have, I have, I love to socialize, but I have a low budget for it. So that's why I try to, if I attend shows, I try to do it from the back and not in a weird like yeah, I just want to be backstage way, but in a just I just want to kind of just chill. My name's Tazoki. I make like bass heavy music. My first rave really like, I'd gone into electronic music and I, I reached out to a few people around the city. Um, I was living in Scotland at the time. And I reached out to a few people like just on Facebook um, and they mentioned that there was like this illegal rave going on and we drove like four hours to like the highlands of Scotland to like in the middle of nowhere. And uh, it was like the worst experience of my life. Like it was so, it was, it was like a free party. In the UK we call them free parties. Um, and it was like terribly organized, terrible weather, there was nowhere to sleep, um, and yeah, it really put like a sour taste in my mouth. And after, after that for a while, I was like, I'm done, like all that trying music. I wasn't really making music at this point, um, well I was, but I wasn't releasing anything. I wasn't like focusing on like a, a name or a brand or whatever. And because of that I kind of took some time off and like it took it took like a good six months I, and I started watching like live videos on YouTube again and things like that of like people doing shows and it was fun like and I was like it can be fun maybe I just had like a bad experience because it happened twice I don't really go out I don't really go, like <laughs> unless it's like for my shows I don't really go out okay um it's like with music as well because I make electronic music I, I don't like casually listen to electronic music I'll listen to like bands and like chill stuff literally all of my friends are like DJs in like the scene um or like the industry which is what people have been calling it and like I'll, I'll listen to their sets I'll go see them live and stuff in my own productions I just kind of make whatever and when it comes to releasing it I'll decide whether it's like in that kind of stream of like where I want to go with branding and stuff but in terms of DJ sets I kind of just ask my friends to send me stuff and like I just mix in keys so like anything goes into anything. One, two, three, four. Artist relations. Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, Slushy here. Before all this uh, this crazy stuff happened, and I was uh, thrust into the wild world of, of dance music, uh, I was really not into that kind of music before. I was uh, super into rock music, like not like metal or anything but like the Beatles like Pink Floyd um, and then I, I got into a game called Dance Edge Revolution and that's when I started really listening to like dance music and like techno and like the super like happy hardcore stuff um, but I never really went to a show ever until um, EDC New York like the year of my first show 
So like, I, I was just like, I, I was like, I was like a, a a lover of the music from afar. But I actually uh, was attending because uh, my friend Marshmallow was playing uh, one of the stages, and I actually at the time I, I only lived like an hour away. So that was like my first, like my first festival experience. Just like they were like, you know, come out. It was super cool. We can just, you know, chill before and after the set and stuff like that. So like, I didn't know what to expect. And like, you know, I'd never been to any any other festivals, like any other EDCs. So New York was my first like festival and EDC experience. So and it was it was great. That was my first time watching Mellow set. And for me, like not having seen many full sets it was really like eye-opening for me because like it really helped me sort of build my set because I, I really didn't know like you know what a, what a good set sounded like or whatever because i i'd only listen to like snippets of songs or snippets of live sets so that was awesome like getting sort of like like the the knowledge of like what to do because i mean like he's he's like a big brother to me anyway so um another really cool thing was that uh the whole festival was catered by chipotle which that's kind of amazing because there was just like i remember the one thing that, that that's clear as day in my mind is going inside to catering and seeing a giant like three gallon bowl full of guacamole from chipotle that was it was like the most insane thing i've, I've seen to this date like at a festival you're tuned in to wide awake stories how many puns can we come up with about starting this next interview? Uh, quite a few. Hey, Deidre, I... could you push the button on that interview? Or... Yeah, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I'm, I'm sure there's a few ways that we can intro this next segment. 2017 isn't over yet. Obviously, New Year's is coming up, but Above and Beyond are going to be coming through the convention center, which is a massive venue. We've hosted Cascade there. The Chainsmokers have come there. And on the 29th of December... Sam is going to be there. Sam is going to be there. Uh, yeah, come find me. <laughs> <laughs> you were in his Wide Awake Story shirt. And Above and Beyond are going to come through, and uh, Pasquale Rotella, our head night owl, caught up with Above and Beyond, and they talked about the upcoming show and about this new record that they've got coming out in January. Above and Beyond interview, that's not an easy one to get. Yeah, nor is the Pasquale interview. It's it's all They're, they're both very difficult to get. Stars aligned <laughs> or something. But we got them both. We yeah. linked up via Skype. Uh, exclusive interview. This is Wide Awake Stories. I'm Pasquale Rotella. I'm here with Jono and Pavo from Above and Beyond. Can you hear barking dog? Sorry, that's my dog. Uh, <laughs> Beatsy's saying hi as well. We have- Pascal, <laughs> thanks for having us on your show. Come here. Come here. Hang on a sec. Let me just get the dog so that she's not going to bark. Hey, come here. So there's come actually here. a fourth member of Above and Beyond. Yeah, and did yeah, you know Jono's dog is actually on Twitter? So uh, <laughs> she does the backing vocals. <laughs> what is the twi- Twitter handle? Angela Bitsy. Angela Bitsy. Let's talk about this new album, Common Ground. You've dropped three singles so far, all with very different vibes. What were your inspirations for the new record? This album is like a collection of tunes we've been writing over the, I'd say, over two, two and a half years. Bits and bobs from here and there. And we've also worked with, um, you know, Zoe. We've worked with Justin Suisa. Um, Tony's been writing quite a lot of new vocal bits. And then we've on this one, we've worked uh, with a new singer called Marty Longstaff, who's singing on, on Tightrope. So um, it's just been a combo of writing sessions with different people and then literally the last sort of six months has been hard work us getting it all sounding good but uh but it's it's awesome to be, be able to now say that we have a we have a new album and it's coming out soon yeah i was going to say that the in terms of the inspiration there's no set sort of inspiration in terms of a theme that we were inspired by it's um like pavo said it's it's stuff that we have written over the years so it's kind of inspired by our lives by synthesizer sounds by conversations with people you know all sorts of things really but i think in terms of um after the writing phase we spent a lot of time on the production actually and um really got you know really fell in love with working in the studio in an intense way again um and dug out a lot of analog synths uh, Parvo dug out his Moog, old Moog Prodigy. We've got some uh, the new Moog Model D reissue, which is based on um, 
an, an old 1970s Mini Moog. Uh, it's the same, basically, but remade for now with MIDI. Um, Roland Jupiter A, all of these classic synthesizers we've used, basically. So there's a, there's quite a lot of analog gear on the album compared to usual, certainly for us anyway. I wouldn't say it's all analog. The sound stage is quite dense, and yeah, so we're really pleased with it. And hopefully, hopefully people like it. But you just you can't you know you can't control that. You can just do your best at the time and then see what happens when it goes out there in the wild. You know. Well, I feel the excitement out there so far. People love the singles that you've dropped. I know that because um, all my friends are huge fans. And you guys have such a huge audience here in Southern California. I, I think people would love to hear about how some of the, you, you spoke about the vocalists that got on board with you guys on the album. Do you have any stories that you can share on how those collaborations came about? I, I suppose, especially with this album, we've worked with people um, that we've almost worked from almost the birth of above and beyond. Uh, Justin Swiss, obviously, um, was the first singer that we worked with and you know within the probably six months of doing stuff with Justy we were already working with Zoe Johnston as well and obviously Tony's been um, writing songs ever since we started so in terms of the songwriting team it's been really sort of going almost back to basics and one of the really exciting things for us is working with Richard Bedford again uh, who was the singer that we've done tracks like Sun and Moon with um, and Richard's uh, singing on Northern Soul which we're really happy with so it's, it's almost been this kind of going back full circle working with you know the, the people we we always have and then even being able to bring Richard back as well it's like you have a, a romantic relationship with uh, people that you've worked with before, just like your fans are so loyal to you and passionate about your music. On your acoustic shows, how do you feel that it helps you reconnect with your musicality? I think the first thing for me is the fact we're simply doing something else. And I think there's a tendency in life, you know, you get a job or whatever it is that you're, you're doing, you you tend to stick to the same thing and, and then you kind of can lose interest if you don't do something else. So while it's great fun to do the acoustic stuff, it's there's also an element of it that's taking us away from dance music for a bit, having a bit of a breather, having another sort of almost side career within a career for a moment, and then coming back to it with fresh ears. Because I think that's what happens as you get older. You know, you've done dance music for a while, say, that's what you're doing. And it can almost get a bit samey if you you feel like you're always doing that. So. It's a really nice break to have to go and do another project, something like the acoustic thing in our case, and then come back to dance music with a different perspective on it. You know, just like when you're a kid again, you're just getting into it. It's that kind of feeling. It's like, oh, I can't wait to get back in the studio. You know, after acoustic, I was very much personally ready to stop doing it. And then, you know, couldn't wait to get back in the studio and do some dance music. And I was like, oh, this is where my heart is. Um, at the same time, you know, doing the acoustic stuff, you know, the same is true because you go into Abbey Road and you hear a string section um, playing your pieces of music and, you know, pl you know, playing your chords and melodies. And that's exciting and amazing. And I, I mean, for me, that the I guess that's the best bit of it is the, the, the expansive arrangements and the acoustic stuff. It's just stuff that you can do that you can't quite do when you've got a big kick drum to squeeze in, you know? <laughs> um, so it's kind of exciting to do do those arrangements and work with incredibly talented musicians and to be able to involve some incredible people and realize your dreams in that area is really exciting. And, and like I say, it's, it's a bit of a musical holiday. If you look at it that way, that's what's exciting. Well, it, it really is beautiful how you found a new way to bring your music to people. Yeah, and it's totally credit to Tony because he had the idea of doing it. I think, I mean, Pavo can tell you otherwise, but I think me and Pavo would have been a bit more like, what we, you know, just rocking up and doing some acoustic stuff. It would have felt a bit ballsy at one point in our career. <laughs> I don't know if we would now, but, um, <laughs> you know, Tony was like, I want to do MTV Unplugged. And we're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So everyone brings something to the table, but, you know, the, the acoustic thing is definitely, you know, Tony's idea and people love it. So well done to him, you know? Yeah. And do you think it's important for dance music's growth for artists to try to go against the status quo and, and 
do things like what you've done? I think that the, the problem with dance music is you've got people who haven't heard anything else making it at the moment. And I think that is, you know, I, I don't want to be one of those guys who's like, oh, it was better in the old days or something like this, because it wasn't necessarily, you know. But what I would say is that it's really important to have, as a musician, I believe, to have a lot of influences, different styles of music, to understand the language of music beyond dance music. Because dance music for me is at its best when it's borrowing ideas almost from other genres and other styles and other eras of music. I suppose that's what I would say on that. Every musician and producer is, is different, but at least from my perspective, what's been very useful with doing the acoustic is taking the songs and doing them in a totally different way because I think often in electronic music the production is so integral part of what the song is that uh, sometimes I feel like the songwriting aspect in electronic music isn't being thought of enough, enough so at least for me it's really helped you know taking these electronic things like hello was a really interesting one to, to take into the acoustic form so to see you know if you did it in a completely acoustic form, what would be retained? You know, what would be the, the hooks and what could you use? And it really helps when you are then writing, uh, you know, new electronic material, sort of see it from that perspective. It gives a bit more depth yeah. to the songwriting process. The nice thing about our fans is not only are they generally extremely lovely people who say amazing things to us and support us to do this, um, but they also, yeah, they support us to do what we want to do. And then they allow us to sort of be creative because I, I can't, I've lost count of the amount of times I've heard other musicians say to me, oh yeah, but I can't do that because, you know, it's not what people expect of me in, you know, various paraphrases of that. But I don't feel that way with our stuff generally. Well, we have to make this because, you know, that's what the audience expects of us. And that's why we've been able to go off and do acoustic and stuff like that because we've kind of done that from day one and, and you always alienate a few people along the way and that but that's life but i think the the danger with the sort of social media world is to listen to what people are saying too much sometimes so, so it's a real danger and i think the best artists and the best businesses actually are often when someone has a really clear idea of they, what they want there's a place for market research and all that kind of stuff but it's not always in in music i sort of feel you've got to come at it with an idea you know and start from that point rather than meeting a market if you know what i mean and yeah our fans have been great because they've just sort of invested themselves in us which is amazing so you've been doing the group therapy radio show for about five years now you were doing trance around the world before that why do you feel it's been important to have a regular connection to your fans and what do you feel these radio shows have done for you guys creatively I think when we started, we used to try and get records on the radio. You know, we would actively try and do that um, when we were sort of the early 2000s. And then, you know, over time, we, we wanted to DJ and the, the radio show became an extension of that. But it also became a way of meeting our audience to build a kind of fan base. So and that's why we've, we've kept it going. We really enjoy doing the radio show. It's a great way to also keep on top of new music because when you have a radio show people send you music if we didn't have one of those we'd have to go and seek it out even more than we do already so um it's, it's just a fantastic sort of thing that we have control of rather than feeling like oh our record didn't go on the playlist of whatever radio station you need to be on you know and obviously things have moved on a bit since those days because now you've got spotify and tidal and all these other platforms that apple music that people can listen to music on which is amazing um but you know they, they were kind of gatekeepers at radio and um you know we'd have one record that would go on the radio on a list and then the next one would only go on the c list or not get on at all and we didn't want our career to be and our music making to be in the hands of other labels and gatekeepers really so that's kind of why the radio show became as important as it was but we, we started doing it just for fun really to be honest and i think the annual party that we've been doing now i think for probably about seven years we've been doing one big show that's live streamed you know one <coughs> one a year and and this year you're especially doing the abgt 250 at the gorge amphitheater in washington state it was just one of those moments where i think 
we were all all kind of wondering how could this go you know could we do a festival you know we've never done a festival something that you've obviously done yourself for so many years uh, and this was really our first attempt at putting on a festival and just seeing how well it all went uh, obviously we had great partners there helping us but most of all it was the the fans that came um, that were so good to each other that that I think ultimately made it possible and and, and I think one of the it was for me one of the most amazing things in our whole career just to see yeah. see you know the sort of family atmosphere that we had during that weekend and, and everyone was talking about it like it, it, they kept on calling it a festival and we realized we sort of we weren't calling it a festival so much beforehand um and, you know there's a few mentions of the f word but um after the after 250 we were we were um uh, yeah, we were calling it a festival during and after, which was pretty cool. And then there was a moment actually. Zoe Johnson came and hung out because uh, we often invite people we work with along to some of these shows just to make sure they get to experience the love out there for all the songs and stuff. And um, on the way out of the venue, there was like this river of people flowing out. And um, I said to Zoe, "Should we just get out of the car? We were crossing a little bridge." Should we just get out of the car and just say hello, you know? And we so we were standing on the top of this bridge and, and we waved to them. We got out of the car and the whole the crowd just went nuts. And everybody was screaming. It was just it was crazy. Spe- speaking of the F word, you guys have a massive play in Los Angeles for your big show at the convention center at the end of this month. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about what you have planned? What you think about the LA crowd? Well, obviously, you know we're just doing putting the finishing touches to our album, so it's just awesome to end this year that's been such a big year for us musically. You know, after having just done the Gorge, now just having finished the album, we're sort of coming to say goodbye to the 2017 in the city that we've had so many of our career highlights in. You know, we were just talking about. You know, the acoustic at the Hollywood Bowl. We've done the radio show parties at the Palladium. You know, we did EDC at the Coliseum. Um, and I'm running out of fingers to count these amazing career highlights we've had in LA. So it just feels like the perfect place to to have like the big end of year bash for, for us. So I'm just really excited to really say goodbye to this year <laughs> in LA. I mean, in LA, it's, it's funny, I'm a sort of reformed, cynical Brit, and when I go out to LA, everything feels very positive and, and welcoming, um, and, you know, people seem to love everything we do, which is kind of nice if you're critical of your own work, so it, it feels like a really nice audience to play to, because um, yeah, they, they really they really go for it, and they love they seem to love what we do, so we're always happy to play in LA. I love hearing you mention all these other shows. The little film strip went through my head when you mentioned EDC at the Coliseum and your acoustic show. I believe that this show is that special. The the LA Convention Center has not been used for a lot of events and you guys coming through there is a really big deal. So the anticipation is high. Cannot wait to see you guys backstage and I cannot wait to see you guys on stage. Thank you guys. Thank you for being. No, thank you. And it just feels like a great time for dance music right now, you know, and um, it's just a really exciting time. I think it genuinely is an exciting time to be alive and to have a a career, whichever part of the industry you're in. The enthusiasm from the audience right now is, is, is huge, you know. There's so much good music coming out right now. It's amazing. I love it. Yeah. So it is a really good time. I'm, I'm, I'm really feeling it. And I can't wait for people to hear some of the stuff that we've literally just been listening to over the last two months. We've got so much so much stuff now that uh, that we, we just want to put out there. We're ready. We're ready and waiting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Well, thanks so much for uh, doing the show. And uh, Thank you. see you in about a month's time. See Indeed. you there. All right, see you there. Tune in next month for a new episode of Wide Awake Stories.